going to begin by starting with Pope Benedict's uh, letter on hope. Um, Pope Benedict's a beautiful teacher and his letters on love and on hope are well worth reading. They're a bit solid, they're not uh, particularly easy, but uh, they're worth persevering and making your way through them. And one of the interesting things that uh, Pope Benedict uh, says heading towards uh, life after death, he asks us to consider the unique and unrepeatable nature of each human life, the incomprehensible wonder of being alive, the experience of love. And he said, when we remember those things, he said, then it's death that begins to appear strange and unbelievable. And uh, I, Benedict is basically saying that life is such a gift and so beautiful and wonderful that it's uh, very difficult to believe that it comes uh, to an end. So the Pope was saying, we've, although the reality of death looms large, we're drawn to look beyond it to a reality that we don't know but we know that it uh, must exist. So in the case for life after death, uh, absolutely central uh, to that is the uh, idea of love. That's what we Christians um, are about, is uh, love. Just to digress, I became a bit interested in the Quran. And I, after September the 11th, I read it to find out what was in it. And I read it to see what uh, the Prophet uh, Muhammad said about violence. And he said plenty. <laughs> um, a mate of mine uh, read it and he wanted to see what Muhammad said about love. And not a great deal. Not a great deal. And I say that seriously, not to be, uh, not to be uh, uh, polemical. Because life in its true sense, the Pope said, is not something we have exclusively in ourselves or from ourselves. Life involves relationships. We're born from our mother and father. We're with our brothers and sisters. Most people grow up to be married, found their own families. Life is about love and uh, relationships. So he says that um, it's love that, which gives meaning to life. And uh, any love we experience in this life is uh, not in vain because life and love endure. And so this is the foundation for our belief in the uh, afterlife. And I suppose basically uh, on top of all those very good reasons, hopes, we believe in the afterlife because Jesus, our Lord, told us that there's life after death. At least that's the overwhelming reason why I believe in life after death. I want to believe in life after death. Uh, I think there are good reasons for it, but I believe it because uh, Jesus uh, told us. Now I'll say uh, quite a bit about um, judgment and limbo and purgatory and uh, all these things. Um, but I, I, I want to follow on from this uh, centrality of love by making the fundamental point that our God is a loving God. Our God is more compassionate, more just and more reasonable than the wisest and most loving human being that we could um, imagine. Then it's important that we always uh, remember that. Always remember that. Um, God isn't nasty and capricious. God is not out to get us. Uh, God uh, loves us. God is certainly a just God, but God loves us and God um, always accepts our sorries, our repentances. The reality of forgiveness which Jesus explained to us is a colossal blessing 
And m most of us here, I suspect, have been born Christians and have grown up uh, having heard about uh, God's forgiveness, but it's an extraordinary thing. And for people who don't know about God, they can't uh, understand God's forgiveness because they don't know God. And there are some crimes that only God can forgive. If a person's been killed, they're gone. They're not there to say, I accept uh, the, the, the repentance of the murderer. But God will accept that. It's a spectacular grace. And of course, uh, I, I mentioned jokingly Catholic guilt. It's real. We need it. All of you might be very good, but I'm not. Uh, it's, um, it's good that we feel um, guilty sometimes. Now anybody with normal moral sensibility, they also feel guilt. But they don't know about forgiveness, they don't really know about repentance. They're often wild with themselves and that guilt manifests itself in all sorts of ways, often in anger. And uh, quite a number of times I think people who are really hostile, hate the society around them, hate the power structures, hate the powers that be, hate most people, uh, often they're uh, troubled by guilt, which they don't, uh, sometimes they don't recognise and it surfaces in this anger, this unfocused anger, uh, often uh, towards the authority figures. So, uh, a life after death is part of the Catholic package. Our Lord spoke about it, he spoke about it quite uh, uh, regularly. And it's uh, one of the things that he preached, it's one of uh, the beliefs that we're called to accept. Now a great silence has uh, fallen about life after death in our society. Our society is a strange society because less than one-fifth of the people in our society have got no religion. Yet they dominate public conversation. And there's no reason why they should. Why on earth should one-fifth of the people dominate the uh, pub public conversation? Why can't we talk about God and about things religious uh, publicly? And so one of the things I think we should talk about is uh, life after death. So Smacker Fitzgibbon, he's an old uh, singer who died many years ago. He said, everybody wants to go to heaven but nobody wants to die. <laughs> so heaven's in. There's a big question mark about hell, uh, limbo's out, so they say, and purgatory slipped into limbo. <laughs> but we will come back uh, to all those, um, those things. Now central to the modern scepticism about life after death uh, is a scepticism about punishment after death and a reluctance, uh, the reluctance of many people to accept the Christian teaching that after death we'll have to answer to God for the way we've lived our lives. Now we Christians just take that for granted, but a, um, a lot of people um, don't like that at all. They prefer to say they're relativists, they prefer to say I'll decide what's right and wrong. You can decide too what's right and wrong, but I'll decide what's right and wrong. An American, a senior American Catholic academic was telling me in California he was called to a, they had a day long uh, meeting on morality on right and wrong. He, and he gave his talk about uh, the Catholic belief uh, in moral truths and some actions are right and some are wrong. And he went back to his uh, a group of 13 or 14 and everyone else there was a relativist. They reckoned they could make up their own ideas of right and wrong. And the fellow next to him was a Jew and the, the Jewish fellow, quite a, a senior man, the Jewish fellow said uh, he was a relativist too. And so the Catholic chap said to him, well what about Hitler? And the Jew said uh, very lamely, oh, well, he was probably sincere. <laughs> uh, he might have been sincere at one stage, but he was wrong. And um, 
So we believe in we believe in the Ten Commandments. We also believe in something we call natural law, that is uh, uh, there to be recognised about good and evil. And however imperfectly, we're, we're all geared towards uh, accepting good and rejecting evil. And uh, this, this, uh, this works even psychologically with us. And so that uh, uh, we know from hearing about soldiers that the first time, even in a very good cause, a just war, they might have had to kill someone, often there's a psychological revulsion in their hearts as a result uh, of doing that and they feel it uh, very, very deeply. Um, <clears throat> one of the good points that Pope Benedict makes is that when we're thinking, talking about heaven, it's not going to be more of the same, like earth. Uh, it's not going to be a succession of days forever and ever and ever and ever, because that could uh, uh, be a bit like a curse. If you're old and grumpy and arthritic, uh, or perhaps uh, even worse than that, for that to be going on and on and on and on, wouldn't be much at all. Heaven is like being Im immersed in an ocean of uh, transcendent love. We don't know uh, there will be, we do believe in the resurrection uh, of the body, and I suppose that brings some concept of time, but it won't be time as we understand it. Death is a mystery. Some die uh, well prepared and peacefully, often at home. Remember one good Catholic fellow I uh, know, he was a marvellous old rogue. He used to be a wood merchant and was alleged he used to water the wood so that it would be a bit heavier and he wouldn't have to give you as much as you should. But he was a great uh, Catholic uh, fellow. Uh, went to uh, daily mass, the support of the church, a lot of the charitable... Uh, I remember going visiting him a few days before he died and he was sitting up at home in the big room, all the generations of family behind him. Um, he wasn't uh, uh, moving at all, wasn't able to take much uh, interest. And another one of my friends who knew him well, much younger, said, I bet you I can get him going. So the old fellow was lying in his chair there before his death, so he got a $50 note and moved it <laughs> across in front of his eyes. And uh, lo and behold, there was a stirring. He pulled his hand out from under the sheet and he tried to <laughs> grab the $50 note. He died very much at peace uh, with God and all those around him. Had another terrible, quite different, uh, terrible experience as a much younger priest in a parish, in a small country parish, there was a beautiful young woman. She had, um, I think, two beautiful little daughters. She was pregnant with a third. She was uh, taking lunch out to her husband, who was working on the potato farm, and there was a terrible uh, car, car crash, and she was killed. Two children were killed, and um, the child she was carrying. Uh, was killed. It was a more difficult, it was at least as difficult, probably a more difficult funeral to do uh, than the funeral of my parents. So death comes in very, very uh, different ways. Um, people are living longer. I remember hearing the story of a woman who had retired and people had said, what, you, what are you going to do? And to their great discomfort, she said, I'm going to enjoy myself and prepare for death. <laughs> um, and people don't, uh, don't like you to, uh, to talk uh, about that uh, at all. Death is um, a shadow over all of us. When you're young, death is a distant topic. Thanks be to God, most young people are not obsessed by death. Death is something that happens to other people, generally. Um, as you get older, of course, that changes. Uh, and then sometimes you have very old people who are living on and on and, uh, you know, most of their friends have uh, gone. But the presence or absence of 
her religious faith makes an enormous difference to coping with old age and to coping with death. You can palpably feel the difference between celebrating a requiem mass for a community of people who believe in life after death uh, and are celebrating the life of a good uh, person. Uh, that's very different from the, 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 the blank total grief of people who've got no belief in life after death um, at all. And so we, each of us, should have an ambition to die well, like living well, like marrying well. Not talking about financially, though that probably helps, <laughs> uh, but to, to uh, enter into a good marriage. Bring your children up well. To die well is a worthy Christian um, ambition. And the cross, of course, is the, the in which Jesus died, is our great symbol of hope uh, because it gives meaning to our suffering and it points uh, beyond our suffering towards the, uh, the resurrection. Our Lord, as I said, our Lord talked about life after death. Remember the rich young man, he said, the Master, teacher, what, must, what good must I do to have eternal life? Very, very few young people would put the question in those terms today. Teacher, what, what good must I do to have uh, eternal life? And our Lord uh, built his teaching on uh, life after death from the Jewish teachings. The Pharisees believed in the resurrection of the body, the Sadducees uh, didn't. Early on, the, uh, Jew the Jewish uh, teaching about life after death was confused. Hades was sort of a, a time of partly living and partly uh, not living. That had developed by uh, our Lord's time and our Lord clarified those uh, teachings. So we don't know uh, what, uh, exactly what heaven's going to be like. St Paul said that no eye has seen nor ear has heard nor the heart of man conceived what God has prepared for those uh, who love him. And I think that uh, in heaven, we will enjoy heaven according to the capacities that we've developed. So, uh, if I go to an Aussie rules match, I understand more about what's really going on than I do, say, at a rugby league match or a soccer match. Uh, not to mention, if I went to the ballet, I wouldn't be uh, entirely sure what was going on. <laughs> And so it is with, uh, in heaven, we will participate in the happiness of heaven according to the capacities for loving and compassion which we've developed um, in this life. The, uh, the images we use for heaven are sometimes not particularly useful. Angel choirs, clouds of glory, harps, organ music and fat cherubs. Um, they don't necessarily take us towards what um, heaven is like. It's a little bit like the symbol for the devil. Little black uh, uh, half animal, a little bit with a pitchfork and the tail. <laughs> it's more like a mischievous child or an animal than it is, to say, the spirit of evil that was behind the establishment, say, of the Soviet gulags or the, uh, the Nazi extermination uh, camps. There are two families of scriptural images for heaven. The first uh, talks uh, like earthly delights, like an earthly paradise, the wedding feast, the heavenly Jerusalem, the wine of the kingdom, the Father's house. And then there's another family of images often favoured by the uh, mystics which speak of life, peace, light and overwhelming love. Um, for all Christians, uh, heaven is God-centered. It will be the uh, supreme presence uh, of God, that great mystery of triune, mystery of love, Father, Son and Spirit, that will give us our basic happinesses. But uh, most of the Christian writers believe part of the happiness will be from being also with our uh, loved ones. We also believe in judgment, as I mentioned. Uh, the traditional understanding is the moment of judgment immediately at death and then the final judgment when Christ will come back 
uh, at the end of time. Pope Benedict has said, and I certainly agree with that, I think one of the greatest arguments, uh, in r rational arguments, in favour of life after death is that if God is good, the scales of justice should balance out somewhere. And in this life, many people miss out. This life is unequal and unfair, and uh, a lot of good people seem to suffer more than their due. If this is the end of the story, it would seem um, quite unjust. One of the great benefits of heaven is that the, the scales of justice balance out uh, over um, eternity. In this life, it's never too late to repent. I regularly tell uh, uh, adult groups uh, like yourself um, what I think, I talk to them about what I think are the most beautiful few lines in scripture. Uh, and that is from the so-called good thief. Jesus was being crucified, he was crucified between two thieves. One of them, uh, as we say, got stuck into Jesus and was telling him off. He said, you're a miracle worker, we're all dying, get yourself into gear and get us out of here. <laughs> and uh, the, the good thief rebuked him and said, uh, leave Jesus alone. We deserve to be where we are. Jesus is a good man. And then he turned to Jesus and said to him, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He was probably a thorough going crook, probably a man of violence. I mean, they, they executed people easily in the Roman Empire. But he was still probably a, a thorough going crook. <coughs> and Jesus said to that man of violence, This very day you will be with me in paradise. It's, most, it's a beautiful, beautiful teaching. So it means no matter how desperate our situation might be or the situation of anyone uh, we love, all we've got to do is uh, stretch out and grasp the hand of God because it's always uh, extended um, for us. I suppose for those of us who are talking about love, we have uh, something of a problem and something of a mystery uh, with the, the reality of uh, etern the eternal punishments of hell. How can that be reconciled with a God of love? Um, now we know that there's a hell, but we're not absolutely sure that anybody's in it. It's no church, there's no church teaching that said even Judas is definitely in hell. I mean, he'd be a leading contender. <laughs> <laughs> so would Hitler and Stalin and Mao and Pol Pot. Uh, but we don't know. Life is a mystery. They, they might have repented. They might have. Um, part of the explanation is the reality of human freedom. And uh, some of the greater the, uh, a person's uh, gifts, it in the, often the greater, the better their upbringing, the more capacity they have for freedom. There's a little uh, Latin tag which goes corruptio pessimi optima, uh, corruptio optimi pessima. The corruption of the very best makes for the very worst sort of corruption. Corruption of the very best makes for the very worst sort of corruption. So that's why we're really scandalized when a priest goes spectacularly wrong. And we're also scandalized with, um, with a policeman is really corrupt. It offends us because they're there to do uh, the, uh, the direct um, opposite of that. So freedom, our human freedom is, uh, is very real. And I suspect that the people who are in hell, if they're, 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 they're there, they're there because they resolutely refuse to turn towards God. They refuse to give up their hate. They refuse to ask forgiveness or extend forgiveness. They refuse to turn towards uh, love and um, light. And uh, we, be we believe in the um, resurrection uh, of uh, the body, so 
We don't just believe in the continuity of the soul, of our life principle in some way, but at, at least at the last uh, day our souls will be reunited with our bodies and in some mysterious way there will be a new heaven and a, um, a, new, uh, a new earth. And when we uh, speak about um, God, our best way to God is through Christ. We understand God through Christ's teachings and through Christ's activity. And I started off by saying our God is a God of love, compassionate and reasonable. You've only got to think of the incidents in Jesus' life. He wept over his capital city of Jerusalem when he, when he could foresee what was going to happen to it. He, when um, he met uh, Lazarus' sister Mary, he wept. And uh, they say that the Greek also seems to imply that he was uh, angry, he was indignant uh, at uh, Lazarus' death. That somehow this death was uh, connected with the, the power of evil and the way things were wrong in the world. And Jesus wept uh, over the, uh, the death of his friend. And uh, when we uh, really muck things up, uh, Christ weeps over us too. Then we have the doctrine of um, purgatory. Um, there's, n there's, there's not an enormous amount about purgatory in the scriptures. The word isn't used, but it's certainly there and uh, implied in the second book of Maccabees and in a number of places in the New Testament. The second book of Maccabees, they offered up offerings because it was a holy and wholesome thought uh, to pray for their dead that they may be released uh, from their sins. Now, whatever logical problems we might have about hell and eternity of uh, suffering, I think purgatory makes marvellous good sense. Because who of us here would uh, be prepared to say that we're worthy to go into God's presence? We'd all, well perhaps we wouldn't, I certainly would, need a bit of spring cleaning or dry cleaning <laughs> or uh, some sort of uh, purification. Because, um, uh, you know, some people are better than others, than the rest of us. I remember, and occasionally people are reluctant, I'm not quite sure why, to accept that. And I remember I was giving it to a class, a tertiary class, uh, preparing to be Catholic teachers. And uh, they were a bit reluctant and I said, well, you know, I'm nowhere near as good as Mother Teresa. And I was talking about Mother Teresa of Calcutta, and to my great astonishment, a few of them started to shout out and say, no, 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 you're as good as her. <laughs> and I said, who? No, Mother Teresa of Calcutta. They said, oh, no, no, no. Well, there was a tough old nun at the college with us. <laughs> and they thought I was talking about her. They, they said, no, 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 you're as good as her. Uh, but we have different capacities for love, uh, different capacities for goodness, which we develop um, during our lifetime and uh, over the years. And uh, purgatory, I think, is like studying for a final exam, like going for a driving test. Sometimes we realize we're not ready for it and we need more time to prepare. Or it might be that we've uh, slept heavily uh, overnight, say when we were young and our parents, well, our mother wanted us to get up quickly and came in and turned on all the lights and pulled all the blinds and uh, back and there was too much light. And so you have to put your hands over your eyes. Um, and it could be with our, um, the impurities in our heart, we'll be like that before the blinding a uh, light of uh, God's, uh, God's goodness. Limbo, there was never uh, any formal teaching uh, on limbo. Limbo is an attempt to deal with uh, the fate of those uh, people who die before they without being baptized, especially babies. Never had a chance to choose right or wrong. Um, what will God do with them? St. Augustine, uh, I think he was pretty tough he died in 430. I think he was a bit inclined to say they'd have to go to hell. 
that was just his theory. People realised that seems to be quite unjust. Um, and so I, I'd say uh, limbo is perhaps like the front stalls of the theatre. It's not the best seats of the house, uh, but they'll. Uh, I don't think God will punish them. Will punish anybody because they uh, uh, they haven't had the opportunity for baptism, or because they haven't had the opportunity for belief. In it, uh, where I am, we've got a very uh, a, a young fella comes in to cook for us three or four nights a week. He's a most unusual chef because he's got a science degree and a law degree. <laughs> uh, so um, I know him a bit, and I know he's not heavily into religion. So I, as I was preparing me talk tonight, and I was sitting in the kitchen there, and I said to him, someone said, do you believe in life after death? And he said, no. And I said, oh, God, you're a worry. <laughs> and uh, he said, well, what's going to happen to me? And I said, well, if you're honest and trying to do the right thing, I'm sure God will look after you. And so he said, no worries about that. <laughs> <laughs> but basically, um, uh, I believe that. Now, I've spoken perhaps a little bit uh, too long. I'll... Uh, let it go, but I'm going to uh, finish with a silly children's story. If you've uh, heard the story before and know the answer, don't shout it out. If you genuinely don't know the answer, you might all know it. If you genuinely hadn't uh, heard the story before, then try to work it out. And anyhow, this fellow died and he wanted a tour of heaven and hell. And. Um, so Peter said, right, I'll take you down to hell first. And it was a dreadful place. The air was full of blasphemies. The people were cross and red-faced because they were all sitting at a table. They had a bowl of soup. They had a spoon. But they had to hold the spoon at the very end of the handle. And the handle was about, say, three metres long. <laughs> so that even if you've got an arm like mine, and mine's pretty long, uh, you can't get a three meter spoon into your mouth. And they were so near and yet so far they were, that there was frightful rage and anger. So they went up to heaven and that um, was uh, obviously a marvelous party. Everybody uh, was very happy. I think that one of the priests had just recited or sang. Um, everybody was relaxed. They also had bowls uh, of soup, I think I said, didn't I? They had a spoon, they had a handle, or uh, three metres long, they had to hold it at the handle. But everything was going marvellously. As I said, anybody who hasn't heard the story, what's the difference? Hasn't heard the story? Right down the back. Exactly. It's a very simple story. The ones in heaven fed each other. The ones in hell were so selfish, they were so busy trying to ram the food down their own neck that they never th they were just like they were on earth, they never thought of anyone. I've never heard a better story to explain the difference between heaven and hell. Thank you.